Welcome to Netbook Study. This is the daily current affairs analysis of Hindu newspaper as well as Indian Express newspaper. Along with that, previous year's questions are also going to be discussed. Let's get into the discussion of this. The first news article talks about India, India's neighborhood policy. Uh, this is an editorial, and in this editorial, 70% of the article talks about Bhutan only, uh, the India and Bhutan relationship. And at the when you look at the conclusion, it focuses on the one aspect of India that is India's neighborhood first policy. And this is important from uh, exam perspective, especially uh, GS mains 3 in the mains examination. Uh, from that perspective, it is important. So what I'll do is I'll just go through with the important aspects of uh, India and Bhutan relationship. And then I'll talk about India's neighborhood first policy. Uh, four or five days ago, we had a detailed discussion with respect to India and Bhutan relationship. I had given a detailed analysis how exactly our relationships are. So ri right now, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I am not going to go for an India-Bhutan relationship. I'll just stick on to what exactly it has been mentioned in this news article and then I'll talk about India's neighborhood first policy. Let's talk about in, uh, the contents of uh, here the, with respect to Bhutan. See the Prime Minister of uh, Bhutan, he has visited India. Uh, the main objective of his visit is one particular project that is Geleku project. Geleku is the name of the city in Bhutan and the Bhutan authorities they have taken a decision that they want to improve this uh, particular city. They want to convert into a Geleku mindful, mindfulness uh, city. See if you look at the Bhutan, Bhutan is going for a concept of a carbon neutral. So Bhutan is quite skeptical with respect to whatever the new investment and whatever the new projects are taken shape in their country. They make sure that it is not going to cause carbon emission. From that perspective, even they are focusing on Gelepe project also. So when the Prime Minister of Bhutan visited uh, India, when he, he was having discussion with India, he was expecting India's support with respect to this uh, Gelepe project. And then he visited Mumbai also where he wanted to meet investors and he wanted to explore the opportunities for the investment in Bhutan. So this was the reason Prime Minister of Bhutan was visiting India and uh, Prime Minister of India Mr. Modi also ensured that next, next week I am going to visit the Bhutan. So there will be more uh, talks, more deeper discussions with respect to this Gelepu project here. All you have to remember is the Gelepu, the name of the project that is Gelepu is one of the cities of Bhutan and they want to develop it like a special uh, special economic zone so to attract, attract foreign uh, investment and this Gelepu mind, uh, mindfulness city, this is going to focus on human well-being especially on yoga rest and recreation, spa therapies and mental relaxation channels. And another important aspect between India and uh, Bhutan relationship is hydroelectricity. India has helped idea, uh, Bhutan to establish uh, set up hydroelectric project and India is also buying electricity from these projects. So there is a win-win situation. Uh, there is a huge potential for uh, hydropower generation in Bhutan and India he is helping for the investment also and India is actively uh, involved in the trade trading of this electricity also. So these are the aspects that is mentioned in the news article. Let's focus on Gelepu project now and what what are the things the Prime Minister of Bhutan was expecting when he was visiting India? The first aspect is uh, there was an expectation to commence direct flights, flight between Mumbai, Delhi or and the Gelepu. See, when you have a direct flight, then the connectivity factor it is going to increase. When there is a connectivity factor, the, it is easier for the tourist. It, it is going to be, it is going to be a tourist destination. So that is one thing uh, to commence a direct flight and then comes to provide uh, technology and to provide knowledge in building hard infrastructure. See, uh, in order to development, first you need money, for, then you need uh, implementation of m that money in a proper infrastructure project. So even the technology is also required for the proper implementation and uh, Prime Minister of Bhutan was expecting this particular support from India. And next comes uh, high-end Indian tourists and the business persons. He, uh, Bhutan is expecting, Bhutan, Bhutan want to encourage Indian tourists and business person to visit Gelepu in a control number. See, in a control number is a catch here because I already already told you that this is a mindfulness city and there is optimum level has to be maintained. Overcrowding is again going to cause some problems there. And Bhutan also expecting Indian businessmen to set up shops in the city. These are the expectations from Bhutan and India has assured that yes, we are going to help uh, in this perspective to implement all these aspects. Now the next part of this article, neighborhood first policy, let's talk about this article. See India, especially in 2014, India has taken a decision that we are going to focus on our neighborhood. Neighborhood is going to get the first priority from India's geopolitical perspective. And why is it important? For two aspects. One is for peace in the South, A South Asian region and for the cooperation. See if you look at European Union, you, if you look at other these kind of organizations where neighboring countries, they have a very cordial relationship and it is very 
very easy to take a trade and relationship uh, with respect to the, uh, the these kind of regions arrangements but if you look at the south asian region we don't have that much of that kind of connectivity here there there are so many factors which comes into play but still we should put our uh, first step in this direction to make sure that there should be a peace there should be a cooperation in our neighborhood for that india has uh, seriously going for neighborhood first policy and under the, under the neighborhood first policy there are three aspects we need to focus one aspect is economic aspect under economic aspect we can focus on trade and then comes cultural aspect under cultural aspect there is a people to uh, people connection and then third they uh, it comes the geopolitical aspect for so geopolitical ag aspect it is a connectivity factor between uh, countries in the south A south asian region so these are the three aspects with respect to india's neighborhood for uh, uh, policy we are focusing on economic aspect trade people to people connectivity people to people contact and the connectivity these are the three aspects and let's see in detail how we are taking steps in this direction the first point is see india is giving priority to improve relationship with its immediate neighbors even though india is uh, trying to have, trying hard to maintain that relationship with pakistan also somehow it is not working out except pakistan if you look at india's relationship uh, somewhere uh, there is a positive uh, uh, graph we can see it means that we are very seriously uh, trying putting our steps to improve our relationship yes time and again there are some issues with nepal there are some issues with bangladesh but still on the whole if you look at it our efforts are very genuine with respect to maintain that uh, relationship and then comes regional diplomacy and then building political connectivity to uh, dialogue process and whatever the issues whether there are bilateral issues are the there are multi uh, stakeholders are there the india is focusing on resolving these issues through mutual agreements uh, as an example you can look at the land boundary agreement between uh, india and bangladesh where there were some enclaves that were indian enclaves were there in the bangladesh and bangladeshi enclaves were there inside the indian territory so we had a discussion we had a dialogue process and we resolved this, that issue and we have sorted out this uh, boundary uh, through the land boundary agreement see these kind of resolving factor we are focusing on through neighborhood first policy and we are pushing for free flow of resources energy goods labor and information across the border for that reason we have uh, constituted a body called sac and even this has become a dysfunctional since there is a, a troubling factor from pakistan but intention is to give that first priority for our neighbor uh, countries and we are focusing on trade ties also and initially even under the sarc also we are uh, giving trade is one among the prime factors since it was not successful we are looking at the other countries in the region especially bbi and this stands for bhutan on bangladesh india and nepal these kind of trade agreements trade ties it is going to enhance the relationship and as a big brother in the region india is offering cooperation with respect to disaster management disaster response weather forecasting these kind of uh, uh, humanitarian aid humanitarian aspect is also taken by india and finally it is not only the economic relation it is not only the cultural relationship even at the defense level also uh, we are deepening the security internal security of the entire region through the military cooperation and you know that there are military exercises happens between india and the neighboring country some of the examples of surya kiran between india and nepal and the uh, shramprithi between india and bangladesh so this is the information regarding india's neighborhood first policy and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2017 china is using its economic relationship relations and positive trade surplus as a tool to develop potential military power status in asia in the light of this statement discuss its impacts on india as her neighbor let's move to the next news the next news is regarding msp see this uh, article is also again opinion page so opinion usually the author has expressed his opinion whether there should be msp and whether there should be a legal guarantee to the msp all these aspect has been discussed see these things i am not going to discuss here since it comes under the editorial aspect only what i will do is i'll give you the background information regarding msp this is up to you whether you want to take a positive stand or a negative stand or whether you want a legal backing of msp or whether you don't want legal back backing of msc all these uh, these aspects are up to you you can take a stand if you are taking a stand make sure that you have certain points to substantiate your stand if you think that yes a legal legal status should be given to msp then there should be some of the points to sub, sub, uh, substantiate your stand if you say there should not be legal there is no necessity to give that legality then you should mention at least three four points with respect to your stance so this is the 
aspect and this is what your uh, author is also trying to make so what i'll do is i'll just give you the msp from exam perspective you need to have that awareness with respect to msp and so many times in the preliminary examination this question has been asked and even in the mains examination this question has been asked so minimum support price is one of the hot topics so what i'll do is i'll give the background information i'll give the complete information regarding minimum support price and it is up to you to take a stand and let's talk about minimum support price and what exactly it is see minimum support price it's a it is an assurance given by government and government is giving that assurance to the farmer see usually what happens farmers used to make losses after growing crops so farmers ask the government that see if these kind of things happens then we have to leave agriculture then government told that uh, don't worry we will give you a assurance what is that assurance see whatever the market price is you are, you, you are uh, growing rice and whatever the market price is if there is too much supply happens usually price drop happens if there is if the limited supply happens if the production is less then the price increases these kind of fluctuations we see in the market but government told that see whatever the market situation is we will give you a assured price it means that take an example government is telling that we will give you 100 rupees per kg no matter what whatever the situation and the market level so this is the assurance we are giving and if you are happy with that 100 rupees you can sell it to us even if you are not happy if the in, at market you are getting for somebody is paying you 120 rupees yes you can go and you can sell your crops so this is the arrangement so this is the minimum support price uh, quoted by government of india and every year before cropping season before rabi and before uh, karif usually these uh, msps are announced and these are announced for 23 crops in our country and who is going to decide this this is going to uh, this official decision is taken by government of india only but in order to get into this decision one commission helps uh, to uh, it gives that recommendation and that is CACP this CACP stands for commission for agricultural cost and prices this CACP, CACP analyzes all the aspects uh, how is the supply and de demand is there and what how much money is required for the particular crop production how much government can afford it all these details it goes through with it and it gives that recommendation to the cabinet and cabinet is going to the, take the decision with respect to MSP once everything has been accepted as discussed at the cabinet level then they are going to uh, release the uh, prices uh, for 23 crops and this CACP this commission this works under the agricultural ministry so this is another aspect you need to remember and let's see what are the crops covered under MACP I told you that there are 23 crops that are covered under MACP the, there are seven type of cereals that is paddy wheat maize bajra jowar ragi and barley and five types of pulses Chana, Arhar Dal, Urad, Moong Dal and Masood Dal and then come seven oil seeds, uh, mustard, groundnut, soya bean, sunflower, sesame, safflower and niger seed and there are four commercial crops that those are cotton, sugarcane, copra and raju. The MSP for sugarcane is called as FRP, FRP is fair remunerative price and uh, let's see on what criteria uh, they are going to fix the price rate CACP is going to recommend the prices so CACP is going to consider some of the criteria with respect to recommendation of these prices and what are these criteria one thing is demand and supply of commodity uh, in the market then the cost of production then comes market price in both at the domestic level and at the international level inter crop price parity and the terms of trade between agriculture and non-agriculture and then comes see if the crop production is 100 rupees uh, they are spending then CACP is going to give 50% extra see this is for crop production and this 50% is the effort that has been put by the farmers and their families so there will be 50% uh, margin over the cost production and then comes uh, and implications of these MSP on the consumer of that product these are the criteria considered by CACP to recommend MACP, MSP minimum support price and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2020 there are two statements the first statement is in case of all cereals pulses and oil seeds the procurement of minimum support price is unlimited in any state union territory of India there is no criteria that it is going to be unlimited the first is uh, false and the second statement is in case of cereals uh, and pulses the MSP fixed in any state union territory at the level to which market price will never rise so there is no relationship with market price market price is different MSP is different this is also wrong so neither one or two
let's move to the next uh, article this is regarding an international organization it is that is world meteorological organization in this uh, there's a small piece of information that has been mentioned in this news article news is that world meteorological Org organization has released a report and name of the report is state of global climate report and in this report it has mentioned that 2023 is hottest year on the record so if you ask me this kind of question is it important uh, i cannot say anything but usually uh, if you look at the previous year two three years before if you look at this question paper the report based questions used to come in the examination so from that perspective i have put this particular uh, news article the state of global climate report and it is released by world meteorological organization from that perspective it is important and whether uh, the contents inside the report there I, I don't think it would be possible for you to remember all these aspects and even i've never seen in any examination especially with respect to content content unless and until and unless and there is a deeper discussion and if the news is coming again and again in the newspaper for weeks altogether then that uh, issue becomes important from exam perspective otherwise the name of the report and the organization that would be sufficient but here let me give you guys background information regarding world meteorological organization this is one among the specialized agency of united United Nation organization and this was established in 1950 initially this was international meteorological organization and it was established in 1873 uh, under vienna international meteorological congress this has been established later this uh, international uh, meteorological organization it has changed into the world meteorological organization by doing some internal changes and officially it has become uh, it, it has uh, become a specialized agency and uh, it has uh, linked under the united nations organization in 1950 headquarters is in geneva switzerland uh, if you look at it per presently there are 187 countries and what are the important programs of world meteorological organization the first is world weather watch and then world climate program and third one is atmospheric research and environment program see the world weather watch as the name indicates this is going to monitor the weather conditions around the world then comes world climate program this focus on climate change and finally comes atmospheric research and environment program it focuses on ozone depletion so all the three programs they have a different objectives and different targets so this is regarding world meteorological organization and let's see previous year question on this particular topic moment of moment for change uh, climate neutral now is an initiative launched by this is launched by UNFCCC, uh, UNFCCC secretary. Uh, the reason why I put this question is even these kind of questions have been asked in UPSC. Even though you can, it is so difficult to remember these kind of topics, but yes, these kind of questions do come in the preliminary examination. Let's move to the next news. The next news is regarding another international agency that is in, uh, International Labor Organization and this organization is very important from exam perspective. See the content of this news article, uh, if it if you could able to remember it you can use it in some your some of your mains answer but apart from this i don't see any uh, productivity or any utilization of this because here it talks about uh, the forced labor so many details and the numerical data has been mentioned in this news article one thing it is difficult to remember another thing is it's very hard to use these kind of uh, things in your answer so i'll just give you the superficial information here with respect to this news article the ilo has released a new report in geneva and the name of the report is profit and poverty the economics of forced labor see here it has been mentioned that forced labor 27.6 million people they are engaged in forced labor in 2021 and if you look at the 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 corrupt money or the illegal profit out of these forced labor it is around 36 billion dollar and like the similar data has been mentioned in this news article like sexual violence or human trafficking all these data that how much money they have made all these aspects have been mentioned here uh, it's not at all important but let's focus on ILO international labor organization actually this news has come in both hindu and indian express i don't know the both have have given a uh, bit prominence with respect to this particular news uh, let's focus on ILO uh, that is important from exam perspective again this is one among the uh, uh, specialist specialized agency of united nations organization initially this was established in 1919 see 1919 after first world war a body has been established that is league of nation under the league of nation the international labor organization has also been established at that point of time because there was a severe distress there was a severe destruction at the global level especially if you look at the uh, european uh, continent and the northern american uh, region 
and in order to focus on labor perspective this organization has been established along with the legal uh, sorry league of nations in 1919 headquarters is in geneva switzerland and the parent organization of ilo is economic and social council of united nations at present it has 187 member state as the name indicates international labor organization see whatever it does whatever the decision it takes it is going to be with related to labors only so if you look at the objectives or if you look at the aims or aim of uh, international labor organization this is going to give the labor standards for the entire world it is tell that see these are the labor standards minimum work work hours will be 8 hours there will be two holidays and there will be uh, emergency services see these are the kind of labor standards this is going to give this sets the international labor standards and to set this standard it has passed some of the conventions out of these conventions eight conventions conventions are extremely important. important mm, i don't know whether you could able to remember this or not but these are extremely important and even question has been asked on uh, with respect to particular uh, 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 convention also now let's see what are these eight uh, core conventions of ilo see there are two conventions which talks about forced labor even in our uh, uh, constitution also it has been mentioned two are there are two convention talks about forced forced labor and there are two uh, conventions they talk about equal wages there there should not be any discrimination and there are two conventions which talk about child labor also and in upsc question was asked on the child labor convention and there are two conventions which talk about association especially the working place to form a freedom to form an association these kind of things see india has uh, ratified six out of this eight convention and what are the six convention i told you that there are two convention on forced labor two on wages uh, and two on child labor these six conventions have been ratified by india and other convention that is freedom of association and freedom to organize these uh, association these two convention seven and eight convention it is not ratified by government of india let's go with the name of this uh, uh, conventions also the convention 29 it talks about forced labor convention and convention 105 talks about abolition of forced labor convention this talks about child labor sorry forced labor and then two conventions this talks about wages uh, convention 100 equal remuneration convention uh, convention 111 discrimination employment occupation convention and then comes the next two convention it talks about child labor and here minimum age convention 138 and worst forms of child labor convention 10182 see i would suggest remember these two convention minimum age convention and worst form of labor convention convention number 138 and 182 you can use these conventions in your mains answer especially child uh, related child labor related questions you can expect where you can use this particular data and let's see a uh, previous uh, year question with respect to this particular topic question was asked in 2018 international labor organizations convention 138 182 are related to child labor let's move to the next news the next news is regarding an uh, institution that is fsa fssai fssai stands for food safety and standard authority of india and what is the news news is that this fssai this is going to set up food testing labs the food labs are going to be set up by fss ai there will be here numbers also been mentioned 34 food labs are going to be set up in so many countries around 24 states sorry not states in the 24 uh, not countries in 24 state 34 labs or microbiology labs are going to be constituted the question is why it is important see these days food poisoning the cases of food poisoning is uh, is rising and yesterday we had a uh, uh, discussion regarding uh, rhodamine this is a chemical that has been found in roadside food in cotton candy and in gobi manchurian see these kind of chemicals uh, and uh, See, even though they are not aware whether the food vendors they are not aware of the harmful effect of these chemicals but they are buying it because it's very cheap and it's easily available so these food labs what they are going to give, do is they are going to test the food samples and they are going to give the report and this go, this is going to help government to take decisions with respect to food safety and as of now this uh, food testing lab they are going to have that ability to test around 10 pathogens and it includes e coli salmonella listeria and eventually it is going to increase uh, 
further and also this is going to in add these kind of chemical food chemicals also this is the first step initially we are focusing on 10 food, food pathogens and uh, eventually this ambit is going to be extended and let's talk about uh, if AASAI that is Food Safety and Standard Association, Standards Authority of India. This was established in 2008 and headquarters is in New Delhi. This is a sta statutory body. Strat statutory body it means that this has been established under a particular statute. And what is that statute? Statute is not even a law. That is Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. And this is established under Health Ministry. So this is the basic information here and what exactly this is going to focus see if, uh, if anybody is involved in food manufacturing and food storage distribution sale import all these aspects will be handled by food safety and standards authority authority of india this is going to set the standards see these are the standards being a food uh, manipulator being a food manufacturer you need to follow this. these are the standards set throughout the country and uh, if i am a food uh, storage uh, i am a food distributor then i should obey these rules set by the food safety authority see the question comes here this was uh, this authority was established in 2008 and law was made in 2006 so you can ask the question what about before 2006 how uh, how were we handling these kind of food safety problems before that also there were laws but the issue was there were so many laws and these laws were handled by different uh, department there were uh, for, like uh, there was some law with respect to uh, fruits that was handled by uh, horticulture department and there was some law with respect to vegetable oil this was handled by some other department and milk related aspect was handled by uh, another department animal husbandry so it was difficult to consolidate even if you want to go for a food safety procedures it was difficult for implementation also since all these aspects are handled by different different department so government take, uh, took a decision that see this is difficult to implement what we will go what we, we are going to do is we are going to consolidate all these aspects all these acts which are already there we are going to consolidate it under single department here the department is uh, the department or the ministry is ministry of health and family welfare under this food safety and uh, standard authority of india this is going to handle implementation of all this and what are these acts uh, here it has been mentioned prevention of food adulteration act of 1954 fruits uh, fruit producer order of 1955 meat food producer order of 1973 vegetable oil products control order of 1947 edible oil packaging regulation order of 1988 milk and milk products order of 1992 all these comes under the ambit of fss act as of now and this this under this act all these aspect different different uh, uh, acts which are established under different department different ministries are consolidated under a single frame so this is it regarding food safety and standards authority let's see previous year question with respect to this particular uh, news the two statements have been given and you need to find the right statement the food safety and standards act of 2006 replaced prevention of food adulteration act of 1954 the food safety standards authority of india is under charge of director general of health services in the union ministry of uh, health and family welfare actually this is the first statement is right one second statement is wrong so this is the option a is the right one and this is it for the day guys this pdf is available in netbook study i'll see you guys tomorrow have a good time